How's it going, everybody? My name's Dave Whipple, and you're watching Bush Radical. Tonight, we're going to do something a little bit different. I have all this brush to burn from the cabin project that I started about this time last year. We're going to get a big fire roaring, we're going to sit around the fire, and I'm going to tell you stories. Stay tuned. <laughs> Back in 2018, I was in Alaska, living in a wall tent, deep into the fall. I was doing concrete work, and I left quite late in the season. I'm driving the Alaska Highway back down to Michigan, and I got in the section between Fort St. John and Fort Nelson. It's about 250 miles of road where there is absolutely nothing, and it's the middle of the night. It's pitch black, and I'm cruising along. All of a sudden, on the other side of the road, I pass a minivan, and I swear, man, there's somebody sitting in the front seat of this minivan on the side of this road, and they're barely off the road. About another mile down the road, I couldn't take it anymore. I'm like, man, I wonder if that guy's dead. So I turn the car around, and I come back, and I park right behind him. If he would have reached out the window, he could have put his hand over the white line. He was that close to the edge of the road. And I, I stop the car, and I get out, and I got my headlamp. And I hear a dog barking inside the car. I walk up to the window and I shine the light in and this guy is sitting there in the front seat of the car. He's got his head back and his mouth wide open and the dog is literally on his lap barking at me through the window. I'm like, this dude is dead. And I start knocking on the window and nothing and the dog is going insane and the guy's just sitting there like a zombie. You gotta understand too, this is 140 miles from either town. It's like right in the middle. It's just nowhere. This went on for probably 30 seconds. I'm knocking, the dog's barking, the guy's sitting there. All of a sudden the guy wakes up ah! and he starts screaming. The dog's going wild and the guy's looking forward and he's literally just convulsing. He's like, ah! Initially I'm like, ah! <laughs> and then I'm laughing because I know the guy's alive and I, I thought for sure I found a dead guy. I thought he had a heart attack. He was an older fella. And, uh, and he was unresponsive when I was knocking on the window. I thought for sure I ran across somebody who had a heart attack, pulled off the side of the road, and that's where they were. The guy's just, <laughs> And then he settles down, and you know, I'm shining the light right in his face like a cop, and he rolls the window down. I'm like, are you all right? He's like, yeah, I, I just, I had, to, I had to sleep. I had to pull over. He, I mean, he could have been hit by anybody. He was so close to the road. But it was good to know that he was alive and uh, that I didn't find a, a, a deceased traveler on the side of the highway. Back in 1999, Brooke and I were living in Sitka, Alaska and we were caretaking this campground. It's called Star Gavin Campground. She was working in town and I was working in town. We were staying in a fifth wheel in this campground. One time this, this girl showed up in the campground and uh, she had to catch the ferry the next day and she was camped right next to us. About midnight, we, we don't know where our cat's at and this lady comes and starts knocking on the door of the camper. She's like, she's like, there's a cat in the tree above me. We're like, well, we'll go take a look at it. And we went over, we took our, took our lights, you know, and we're shining it up in the tree and, and there's our cat, Mabel. And she's like 20 feet up this tree. And this tree's probably eight foot across. There's no way you're gonna climb it. And she was on a branch, and I kid you not, like, here's this lady's tent, here's the cat, like, exactly over top of her. Meow, meow, meow. We're like, we have no idea whose cat that is. We couldn't get her down, we couldn't help the lady, so I, mean, I thought it was pretty funny. Speaking of that cat in that campground, when we would get out of work in the afternoons, we would go out to the ocean, and we had, we'd take fly rods and hip waders, and we catch big fresh pink salmon. They're really fresh down there. They're, okay, they're coming right out of the deep ocean. So we would take and catch salmon in the afternoon. We'd brine them and smoke them because we had the only campsite that had electricity. One night, Brooke is vacuum sealing with this little vacuum sealer. And she's vacuum sealing these smoked salmon fillets. Now the cat, Mabel, same cat that was in the tree, the cat was deathly afraid of the vacuum sealer because it made this noise. It was like when it's sucking the air out. Oh, and I'm up in the bunk, up above, like the cab over part. And Mabel is on this little closet that's just right down by my toes. And the cat's about panicked, you know, like she's just, she can't stand this vacuum sealer. 
And my foot's about that far away from her. So I'm just waiting, I'm timing it. Just waiting. As soon as Brooke started that vacuum suit, brr, I just touched her. The cat exploded. Just, oh, it was funny. Well, good's having pets if you can't play with them, right? Hey, nice. Pretty decent fire now. I have so much brush to burn. Speaking of smoking salmon in Sitka, one day we had a big batch of smoked salmon. We were one of those little chief smokers, and we just plug it into the power. We had the only power in the campground because we were the hosts. Well, at that time we had a big collie. It was the first collie I'd ever had. His name was Hooli. Hooli ended up getting into that smoker, and he ate every piece of that smoked fish. And all that smoked fish, you know, it's just brined and salt. Well, for the next day and a half, you couldn't put enough water to that dog. I'm serious. He, he, you, could, you could give him a five-gallon bucket. He'd work his way through it. We just about kempered him with all that salt. Speaking of that dog, in the fall of 1999, Brooke and I went to the Aleutian Islands. We were caretaking a homestead through the winter. We were out there seven and a half months. There's a video on this channel about that. It was quite a time, but I would take the dog for a walk every day, take him walking down the beach. And we're in the middle of nowhere. And at the, at the end of the beach, before it curved back, there was like a point. At that point, there was a big rock spire. And at the bottom of that rock spire was just a pile of rubble. Just, just rocks, you know, just a big rock pile. And that rock pile was absolutely full of ermine, these little weasels. And the dog looked forward to that like it was Christmas. He'd run down to that rock pile and the ermine, it'd be like whack-a-mole, you know. It'd pop up here and there. And, He'd chase him around that pile of rocks for as long as you'd let him do it. One day we went down there and he runs up on the rock pile and there's like this big hole where there was a big boulder, you know, you could, it was pretty large hole. You could crawl in there probably. He runs up and he dives in that hole and he's in there three quarters of the way and he's barking and barking and barking and he's not moving. I'm like, what do you got there, you know, because it wasn't an ermine. I go up there and I pull the dog out of the hole, and there's an otter in that hole. I mean, a big otter. Not a sea otter, even though we were on the sea. It was a river otter. They had both of them out there. And Huli could get about, I don't know, probably two feet from that otter. He's so lucky, because if that otter would have got a hold of him, I don't think he could have got it out of the hole. I don't know if it will let him go. Getting kind of chilly out. Oh, man. Any of you out there ever been lost? I was lost one time. Brooke and I, and our son, I believe, I think it was just the three of us, we were out in Minto Flats, which is about 100 miles to the west of Fairbanks, Alaska. It's just a big flooding. There's a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers. And even on a good day, if you were if you were in a canoe, you could pick your way back through all these lakes and bogs and channels, and you, you could get yourself lost. Kind of just a maze of water. But we were back at our camp. We used to have some property up there, and it was back in a big lake, the very north end of Minto Flats. We we're out there fishing one night, and you could see way over by Fairbanks, as you could see a long ways. There was a forest fire. It was back in by Murphy Dome. If any of you guys know that area. And we watched that forest fire topping out into trees, you know, where it would actually burn enough that it would burn up a tree. And you'd see these trees going up just like candles, you know. From where the fire was to where we were on the flats was probably 40 miles away. You could see it just as plain as day. It was big fire. And there was a ton of smoke. Well, all that evening we'd watch that forest fire from the boat while we were fishing. And you could see the smoke was, so it was blowing away from the fire. You had a view of the fire line itself, and you saw all the smoke going up into the atmosphere. Well, when the morning came, the wind had shifted, and all that smoke blew into Minto Flats. And it was so smoky in the flats, you could hardly stand it. You could hardly breathe. So we packed up all our gear, and we went to head back to the boat launch and drive back to town. Well, where we were at, where our camp was, it was on an island at the very north end of the flats, and it was in a big lake. The lake's probably a half a mile wide and probably two miles long. And you kind of have to pick your way through the lake 
because it has shallow spots and you can run aground pretty easy. And there's a lot of big weed beds. Well, you have to stay kind of towards the middle of the lake. It's shaped like a big kidney. So we took off, headed for the boat launch. We went out towards the middle of the lake. And once you get to the middle of the lake though, you can't see any of the, the landmarks. You couldn't see any ground at all. You're just out in the middle of water and smoke. None of us had a compass with us. So we boated for probably 40 minutes trying to find our way out. But once you did get close enough to see land, you couldn't recognize it. You couldn't, you know, you, you even landmarks you might have seen a hundred times, you didn't really pay enough attention to know what they were. It was just a, a brushy island here or, you know, a half sunken tree over here. And literally we were running out of gas and we're down to about a quarter of a tank of gas and we're completely lost. We don't have any drinking water either. So, I mean, we're to the point where we're, we almost have to go back to the nearest shore we find and start boiling water to drink. Anyway, we ran across this huge section of timber and you could tell it was the mainland, but we had no idea where on the mainland we were at because the flats butt up to the side of these low mountains. But this was big timber. You could tell it was part of the mainland. It wasn't, it wasn't just a little island. And we floated around there trying to place it, trying to figure it out. The visibility was probably a hundred yards. And as we were motoring along, we motored away from that land, back out into the open water. We finally come across this island. And we sat there with the motor off, trying to figure out where we were at. And after sitting there for probably 10 minutes, just studying the land, trying to, tr trying to get your bearings, completely lost, almost out of fuel, totally out of water. We finally realized the island that we were staring at, that we were drifting right in front of, was our property. It was our camp. It's where we started from. We've been on the water for probably an hour at that time, burning fuel, trying to pick our way through islands and bogs and channels, and we finally found that where we'd ended up was exactly where we'd started. You know how they say that people who are lost in the woods walk in circles? Well, you could do it with a boat too. What we decided to do after that is we, we stayed in shallow water close enough to shore that we could actually keep an eye on the shore. And even though we ran aground lots of times and, and chopped up bales of weeds with the prop, we did make it back to the boat launch. But that feeling of being lost is it's a unique feeling once you are lost uh, it, you, you don't forget what that feels like so there was this other time out in Minto Flats my buddy Brian and I went back in to break camp now Brooke and I had a wall tent on that property and we'd take the kids back there, and we'd take the dogs, we even took our cat back there. In the fall, we would go take the tent down, roll it up, put it in a tarp, and that's where we would leave it for the winter time. Well, my buddy Brian and I decided we're gonna make one trip in there, do a little bit of fishing, and we're gonna break camp. Now this is back when I was pretty sick. I had stomach condition that I was fighting for years. And, uh, I, and I wasn't really doing that good health-wise at the time. So Brian was going to go back in there with me, and he was going to help me break down that tent. We're going to spend the night out there and do a little bit of fishing. Well, what we found is when we got out there, the water level had dropped so far. In the fall, the water level in that area, it really falls down. And in, in the wintertime, there's, there's not this big flooding of water. There's not these lakes and sloughs everywhere. There's just a river that runs through that country. This is probably almost October. It's very cold. And we boated back in there and we kept running aground. We're running aground because everywhere was shallow. Ultimately, we, we got to the point where we were, we're starting to panic. It's almost freezing. We can't find deep enough water to run the boat in. And even if we made it to the camp, we still have to make our way back out. It's about a three mile boat ride. And we'd probably turned it into about a four mile boat ride because we made so many stops and turns just looking for deep water. We finally get 
to where we could wade to the island. We were maybe a hundred yards from it and we'd been run up on ground hard enough we had to actually get out of the boat and shove the boat off a sandbar. And uh, neither one of us were very happy. There wasn't a whole lot of fun going on. We finally got the boat shoved off there and we, we made our way that last hundred yards to the island. When we got to the island the tent was just flying in the wind where it had been tacked down around the platform all the nails had come loose and the tent was just flying so we're wet we're really cold it could snow any time it was that cold out and our tent we're going to stay in is, is just a disaster we grabbed a couple nails and some hammers we went and we tacked the edge of that tent down we actually had a wonderful evening after that we got the tent nice and toasty you know all the hard feelings had kind of settled down because it was panic mode there for a while I thought we're going to freeze, we're, we might have to swim to get to the island where the tent was. And you never know, I mean what if we'd got there and someone had stolen the tent and we're soaking wet and the boat's high and dry out on a sandbar. It was just a bad situation. Well we got nice and warm, had something to eat, got the tent situated, had a great afternoon. It was, the rest of the day was, was really nice. Next morning we took the tent, we broke it down, folded it all up, put it in a tarp. It took us about another hour and a half to boat out of there, about four miles again, running aground left and right, just looking for deep water. We finally made it back to the boat launch. We had ice built up on the front of the boat, probably a half inch thick, so you can tell how cold it was. We sat in the truck and we ran the truck for probably 40 minutes, just sitting there you know, blast in the heat. I had an old 18 horse Johnson, 1957. I still have that motor. And that motor leaked, the lower unit. So like the gear lube in the bottom of the motor leaked. When we got back, I dropped Brian off and I went home. By the time I got back home, I knew that I needed to drain the lower unit, the oil out of the lower unit because it probably was full of water because it leaked. And we'd been running it hard and running aground and it was just a, a lot of time running that motor. And I knew I needed to drain that lower unit. Because if it had enough water in it, it could freeze and break. But I was so sick and I was so wore out from the trip, I just went to bed. Next day I woke up and the bottom of that lower unit was split in half. So I went out there, I took the screws out of the lower unit and I pulled the lower unit apart because it's a two piece. When I pulled that lower unit apart, there wasn't any oil in it at all. It was just a block of ice, and I mean clear ice. We'd run all the oil out of that lower unit, and the lower unit was just full of nothing but water. And I mean just water. You could have took the ice out of the lower unit, and you could have put it in a Coke and used it as an ice cube. It was so clean. I put a heater and a fan on that block of ice on the lower unit, and I'd melted it all out. And then I took a little hammer and gently beat the aluminum back to where the crack was closed. And uh, I epoxied it and then siliconed it, put it all back together. And that motor still runs to this day. But what a trip, man. I didn't think we were going to get out there and I didn't know if we were going to get back or not. The very first time we went to Valdez was back in 2000. It was my brother Ryan and I. He's quite a bit younger than I am. And we drove a 1979 Volkswagen Rabbit down to Valdez, a little diesel rabbit. And we had a great time. We were fishing pinks and, and we're getting into silver salmon. It was about that time of year when the silvers were coming in pretty good. Valdez is on a great big fjord, kind of. And it's up towards the, the end of the fjord. But about four miles down the fjord, there's a place called Gold Creek. And it's just a creek that runs into the ocean. And the salmon like to go up Gold Creek. Some locals were telling us about it. They're like, yeah, that's a really good place to go for, for silvers. And there's a nature trail that went all the way out there. So Ryan and I, we took our waders, put them in backpacks, took our fishing rods, fly rods, we're fly fishing. And we walked that four mile trail. Now Valdez is nothing but brush. It's full of bears. And there's no place that's got more bears than Valdez, Alaska. And we're walking up the side of this hill in the bush and the Devil's Club and the thick alders. Just this tiny little trail. 
and it took a long time. We finally get to the end of the trail to Gold Creek. The day had went from being kind of socked in and drizzly and calm to now it was, was kind of getting sunny out. And when it gets sunny in Valdez, a lot of times it gets windy. So Ryan and I, we, we, we decided we're, we really couldn't fly fish because it was so windy you couldn't cast. So we decided we'd just head back to town. But we got the bright idea that as opposed to walking that nasty trail back, which is full of nettles and devil's club and prickers and briars and alders and bear scat, we're just gonna walk the beach back. It's about, about four miles. We start walking the beach and it's, it's beautiful. You know, you're right there on the ocean. You know, it's kind of a slack tide. The tide has went out, but it's not yet coming back in. And it just, it was just a nice walk. But it started getting rocky. And then it started getting kind of bouldery. Lots of big rocks. And the beach got steeper. Meanwhile, the tide is coming in. It's coming in pretty good. The farther along we got, we just got into a steeper bank, bigger, slipperier rocks, and then the water is pushing us up closer towards the woods. And the woods is just a tangled mess. You can barely move through that country. It is so thick. It's not any place anybody goes hiking. Well, we just kept going, hoping things would get better, but they never did. They just kept getting worse. Pretty soon, the tide is most of the way in. The beach has disappeared, and we're just walking along this rocky hillside, probably 20 feet from just brushy woods. And then we started coming to cliffs. These little stone cliffs where, where the bank kind of just leaned out. The first one, we walked up into the woods. We picked our way through the alders and the devil's club, and we made our way down the other side because you couldn't walk around the cliff because it went right down into the water. We made it another 100 yards or so and we came to another cliff. We did the same thing. We climbed up into the woods and we literally had to climb with our hands and feet up the bank to get to the woods. If you were to go around the face of it, you'd be in the water and you couldn't see around it so you didn't really know how far you would have to go or if once you got to the other side if it was any better. Needless to say, again, you know, the mood sucked. It, nobody was happy. We were pushed up against the brushy woods by the incoming tide. And that part of the beach had just turned into basically a wet cliff. Well, we went over top of the second cliff, picked our way back down to whatever beach there was. And just on the way again, you could see that there was another cliff. Went way out into the water. You could see we would have to absolutely climb through the woods. But by the time we got down to that cliff, the terrain was so steep we couldn't get up into the woods. On the other hand, you could see that on the other side of that cliff was a sandy beach. And when we first started on that trail, we walked by that section of sandy beach. So we knew we were pretty much there. All we had to do was get around that cliff and we're past all the bad stuff. We're to the end. We're kind of back where we started. And the trail from that point is flat. It just goes through some flat, boggy areas. And then we're back at the car. I said, well, what I'm going to do, Rye, I'm going to put my waders on, and I'm going to walk around the face of this cliff. And hopefully it's not going to be that deep. I put my hip boots on, held my fishing rod up above my hand, and I started walking out around the face of this cliff. And it got up way up towards the top of my boots. Once I finally got out, to where the cliff turned and I couldn't see Ryan anymore, I was up to the very, very top of my boots. I rounded the end of that cliff and I'm yelling back and forth to Ryan because he wants to know. He says, how deep is it? Well, it kept getting deeper. Pretty soon I'm up to my chest. And then just a few more steps, I'm up to my chin. I've got my fishing pole over top of my head. I'm committed at this point, right? And Ryan's yelling at me. He says, how deep is it? How deep is it? I said, well, it's only just up, just barely below the top of my hip boots. It's not that bad. And then I'm swimming for about the next 10 feet. You know, I, I could touch the bottom. I mean, it was right there, but I mean, it was, it was six feet deep, right? <laughs> and Ryan's like, I'm telling him at the same time, I'm like, you could just keep coming. You know, it's, it's not that bad. And I'm swimming as I'm yelling this to him. I got my hands up on the rocks and I'm, you know, swimming, bobbing my way around the end of this cliff. And uh, by the time I got, oh, I don't know, another 25 feet or so, 
you could see there was the end of the cliff and you're right there to the sandy beach. It was, it was right there. It was maybe 40 feet away. You know, it's getting shallow. And I'm yelling to Ryan, just keep coming. It's not that bad. And back behind me, I could hear Ryan making his way around the cliff face. And he's starting to swear. And he's like, what? <laughs> and I'm just cracking up. You know, this is my little brother, right? I mean, it's, we're out on an adventure. But, you know, I knew at that point, we're, we're going to get cold and we're going to get wet. But we're right there. We're right at the end. And uh, I'm telling him to keep coming. And, and as he's finding out that the water is six feet deep and he's going to have to swim. I'm wading out the other side, you know. And he's just back there just giving me fits. But I made it around the cliff face. And then <laughs> Ryan made it around the cliff face too. And, you know, he kind of got the joke at that point, you know. I mean, he, he was cussing and swearing and flailing back there and swimming a bit. But, but, you know, being at the end, you know, it was worth it. And it's it's always been a good story ever since. But if you're ever in Valdez and you want to go fish Gold Creek, there's a trail that goes to Gold Creek. And they put that trail there for a reason. Keep that in mind. My first trip up to Alaska, I planned on going fishing in the Bering Sea. I'd met a guy who'd given me a tip about getting hired onto a boat. He said, you can't really get hired onto a boat in Alaska very easy. So you want to go to Seattle. Most of the people who own the boats, their offices are in Seattle. So if you want a job on a boat, go to Seattle. And he gave me a guy's number to go talk to. Well, I drove my piece of garbage truck all the way across the country to Seattle. I'd never been west. I drove downtown Seattle and, and kept asking directions until I found the office of a uh, of a fishing company that owned a, a boat. I think it was called the Norwegian Star. I remember the guy who owned it and I went and talked to him at his office. And I guess they get a lot of rough customers that apply to be on the boats. Because just being a kid from the Midwest you know, he was uh, he was pretty eager to work with me. He's like, yeah, we'll, we'll put you on the boat. He'd ask what jobs I'd done before. I'd been doing concrete for a couple summers. And so somebody that's, you know, a big kid from the Midwest who's who doesn't have like a criminal record and, and is used to hard labor, I think he, he wanted to hire me pretty bad. So he gave me this long list of stuff I had to buy. And I was going to go tomorrow to uh, to get on a plane and fly to Dutch Harbor. But I've been having such a good time driving, I was really kind of torn. When I talked to the owner of the boat, he told me that they would give me a, a half a percent, I believe. And it was all dependent on the catch. So I could work all summer long and end up with nothing if it was a terrible year. And if it was a good year, I could end up, you know, making some pretty good money. But it was kind of a gamble. I went to this flea bag, scuzzy motel in downtown Seattle. And... I was sitting there all night trying to figure out if I actually wanted to go out on this fishing boat or if I wanted to just keep driving. Maybe I'll just drive up to Alaska and maybe I'll pour concrete for the summer and uh, not roll the dice so much with this whole, you know, fishing thing. Well, that previous winter I'd been doing sheetrock in the wintertime and I had a cooler in the back of the truck full of brand new sheetrock tools that I just bought to take with me out to Alaska in case there was that kind of work. And these are brand new tools that I just bought from Home Depot in Michigan. And I'm sitting there in that flea bag motel in downtown Seattle. And just down the street is a Home Depot. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go to Alaska. But I could use a little bit of gas money. So I drove down there and I pulled that cooler out of the back of the truck and all the tools I had, I still had the receipt for and they were all in the packages because I, I couldn't take the company tools with me. So I bought my own set of tools. And I took them back to Home Depot and they're like, sure, yeah, you bought them at a Home Depot. You have the receipt. So they, they gave me back the cash I'd spent on them. It was a couple hundred dollars, which at that point, you know, was a ton of money. I'm just a kid, you know, I, I think I was 22 years old. So I returned all those sheetrock tools. I had the money to go to Alaska. And I spent the rest of that night sitting in the hotel trying to think, man, do I want to roll the dice fishing or do I want to go to Alaska and at least, at least get a job doing something that I get paid by the hour. The next day I got up, I just put the truck in drive and 
headed north. I probably should have called the guy with the boat. He didn't owe me nothing, I didn't owe him nothing, and I hadn't invested any more money, and he hadn't invested any more time, and I just, I just washed my hands of the whole thing. Sometimes I wish I would have went on that fishing boat, but things turned out pretty good in Alaska. I ended up working on Allison Air Force Base, finishing concrete, but I almost ended up on a salmon boat in the Bering Sea. You never know what life's going to throw at you, right? That's pretty interesting. Full moon tonight. It's gonna to be bright. Everybody knows what full moon means too. Werewolves. Seriously, being a YouTuber who shoots a lot of content outdoors in, in remote places, one question I get asked all the time is, uh, you ever seen a Bigfoot? And the answer of course is no, I've never seen Bigfoot. I don't think there's any such thing as Bigfoot. But I like to joke about it. I tell people, no, there's no Bigfoot around this area because it's this is werewolf country and the werewolves run the Bigfoot out. And I say woofs too, you're like a fifth grader. I don't know. <laughs> it's not it's not polite to tease people. Do people hear weird things in the woods? Absolutely. Do people see stuff they can't explain? Totally. Is it Bigfoot? No, I don't think so. But a lot of times you can be right there with another big animal in the woods and not know anything about it. A lot of times big animals are mistaken for things that don't exist. I was on an island, the same island in Minto Flats, camping with my son Mick. This was probably five years ago and we, I actually shot this, this is on a video. We decided we we're going to eat breakfast and then we're going to go fishing. So we made some breakfast and we jumped in the boat. And we're fishing right out in front of the island because it's good fishing right out there. Well, we happened to look up on the island. It's like, there's our tent and there's a great big black bear. It's an island, you know, it's a small island too. Probably 10 acres. So, you know, that bear was with us all night. Bear was with us all morning. He was right there. I wouldn't have probably camped on that island had I known he was there too. A lot of times the really scary stuff in the woods is uh, is your own bad decisions. Like going out to break camp and, and <laughs> getting hypothermic, almost not getting out or getting back. That was a bad decision. Walking the beach back in Valdez and getting pinned up into the brush and the cliffs. That was a bad decision. To this very day, I carry a lighter in my pocket. Everywhere. It could be the summertime, could be the wintertime, doesn't matter. I always carry a lighter. You never know when you're going to need to burn some trash or you're going to need to start a fire. Back in 2001, I believe it was, went on a canoe trip on the Chena River. It was a beautiful warm day, sometime late summer. It's probably 80 degrees that day. So we're all in shorts and t-shirts and we floated this section of the Chena River that we'd never been on before. It was supposed to be about a four hour float, three, four hours. It turned out to be about eight hours. And about two hours into the trip, me and the guy that I was canoeing with, we flipped a canoe. The water was a couple feet deep. Wasn't a big deal, but we got soaking wet. By the time we got off that river, let me stoke this fire. So by the time we got off that river, I was hypothermic. Even just a, just a simple Bic lighter would have saved that situation. But I couldn't, I couldn't function, I couldn't use my hands. I was just shaking violently. It was a bad deal. The moral of the story is this, most of the stuff in the woods that's really dangerous is just your own bad decisions. How's that for lighting? Even my boots steaming. One of the most dangerous things in the woods is pace. It's your pace, the way you travel in the woods, where you're you know, if you're just walking too fast, you'll kick up a stick and jam it into your shin and take dives and hurt your hands and scar up your shins, get stuff in your eyes. If I was going to tell anybody, if anybody ever asked me, not that they would, but if anybody ever asked me, what's the one thing they need to keep in mind if they're going to spend a lot of time just in the bush, I would say it's pace. 
pace causes more injuries than anything else. Any more injuries than Bigfoots and werewolves. Well, we still have a little bit of fire left. I'm going to tell you guys the story of how this channel came about in the first place. I'll give you the one minute version. I got out of high school 30 years ago, almost. Went to work doing concrete. Brooke and I met. We started dating. We got engaged. We ended up in Alaska. We went to the Aleutian Islands in Sitka. We lived in Fairbanks for six years and Delta Junction for six years. When we were in Delta Junction, I watched the first YouTube video I ever saw in my life. It was my buddy Brandon Lardy. He was playing in a band called Centerville. Like he sent me this link of where to watch their YouTube. They had a they had a video they put on YouTube. So it's like 2006, seven, somewhere in there. He sends me this link of hit the band he's playing with at the time. It was on YouTube. YouTube was like a brand new thing. And I remember just being amazed because Brandon's always been <laughs> like super smart guy, right? Like he, he has everything figured out before anybody else does. And uh, I remember just being amazed, like Brandon, how did you get like this footage on the internet? How did you get it on my computer so I could watch it? I didn't understand the technology. I didn't understand, I didn't know anything about YouTube. So the first YouTube video I ever watched was my buddy Brandon's band playing live. It was like one camera, like 50 feet away from the band and it was, you know, the sound sounded like you're in a culvert. Great band, but poor video, it wasn't very good. But it was revolutionary in my mind. I'm like, how in the world did you do that? Once I became aware of YouTube, you know, I started finding stuff on there that I liked. And pretty soon I started finding, you know, kind of kind of stuff that was, you know, blue collar guys doing, you know, building stuff and reviewing tools. And there was, there was a few like camping and bushcraft and survival was like becoming a thing too. You know, Les Stroud had Survivor Man out and you know, there was a little bit of that stuff on YouTube. I finally got the idea that regular dudes can put stuff out there and, and, and they're actually getting views. People are watching it. I was kind of amazed because I, I, I didn't know what YouTube was all about. I didn't know what you could do with it. Pretty soon I started seeing ordinary people like myself were, were doing stuff that other people were watching. I said, wow, that's really interesting. So I kind of got it in my head. I, I always thought, you know, I, I would really like to start a YouTube channel because all the time in Alaska and all, all the stuff that Brooke and I did up there, all you could do is take a picture and send it back home to your, your relatives. And you really couldn't share it with many people, just a couple people, you know, you'd tell stories, but that's all you could do. So I always had it in my head after that. It's like, man, I would love to share a lot of this stuff. I, I think there's a lot of stuff people would be interested in watching. I built several cabins at that time. And I think, I'd be, I, think I became aware of like the Dick Prennicky video sometime in that time frame. I think that came out in 2003, I believe. The book was older than that, but the video, I think, came out in 2003. And by then, I'd already built a cabin and a house. But finding out that you could actually do something on YouTube, something that an average guy could put out and people were gonna watch it, that was kind of revolutionary to me. And I always had it in my head after that. I would love to start a YouTube channel. You know, my wife, Brooke, is just amazing. She's always doing something. She's She's got a million ideas. And she was, starting to dabble in film work back then too. She shot a, a documentary on the Mount Marathon race in Seward. She got into YouTube a year before I did. And I remember she'd been doing YouTube for about a year when we were on Alone. And on Alone, of course, the show on the History Channel, if you don't know what I'm talking about, on that show, everybody runs their own cameras. You're by yourself out in the middle of the wilderness and it's your job to shoot everything you do. And that's what they make the show out of. So it was really amazing uh, to be part of that, of course. It was, a, it was a great opportunity, great experience. But I also learned how to run a camera on that show. And when I got out, I bought a camera and I started doing YouTube in 2017. So I, I, I'd been wanting to do YouTube for probably five years at that point, but I had thought it was, I was always intimidated by the learning curve of all the technology. By the time I actually had been through alone, I realized that the camera work was really easy. I edited my first video and I found out that the editing was really easy and that I enjoyed it. And ever since then, uh, you know, here we are. That's what we've been doing, been making videos and that hopefully you guys enjoy. And that's how this channel came about. When I was a kid, one of the things I loved to do, once in a while my grandpa and grandma would call everybody down to their cabin and they would do slideshows. They'd get the projector out and they, they had so many of their trips and stuff turned into, turned into slides. So fishing trips and traveling trips and stuff. And 
they would sit there and, and have slideshows and show all these interesting places and campgrounds and, and fishing and camping trips and they would tell about what happened and the funny stories and the, the, the camp talk and I just loved watching those slideshows. Also about the time I was, I don't know, maybe 18 years old, my grandpa and grandma, they showed me this video. It was called Trails of the Mountain West by Don and Jack Cooper. There were a couple guys from Montana and they built this, they built a little cabin on the back of a Model T pickup truck and then they drove it from Mexico to Alaska. And it's just one of those old, you know, it's from the 60s or 70s. The color is amazing. It was shot on film, not video cameras. And, and the guy narrates this whole travel log of going all through the Rocky Mountains and up to Alaska and spending the winter up there. It was absolutely magical. So when I got into YouTube, I had, you know, the slideshows from my grandparents' house in my head that I always, they were always magical. And then... That video, Trails of the Mountain West, I, I thought it would be amazing to be able to do travel logs. And then when YouTube came around, it gave everybody in the world the opportunity to put their stuff out there for everybody to see. And between alone, Trails of the Mountain West, Grandpa and Grandma's slideshows, that's how I got here. That's how I ended up doing this channel. So if you've ever wondered how I ended up getting this channel up and running and getting into YouTube, that's kind of my story. Those are the things that really struck a chord with me. Well guys, I would love to sit here and just chat with you all night, tell you stories, but I'm afraid I'm about out of brush to burn. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name's Dave Whipple. You've been watching Bush Radical. Be radical, eh? See you soon.